Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Andrew Chidane. Andrew received his PhD in chemistry from Cornell and a JD from George Washington Law School, so he's both a chemist and a patent attorney. He has done interesting things using this unique skill set, including in his current role as the founder and CEO of Camtech, a biotechnology startup pioneering next-generation psychedelic drugs. Andrew and I discussed multiple topics related to or adjacent to psychedelic science. We talked about the various research projects he's engaged with at Camtech and various academic lab partners that they work with. We talked about the chemistry of magic mushrooms, including compounds beyond psilocybin, found in many species of psilocybin-containing mushrooms. We talked about the so-called entourage effect, the idea that multiple compounds found in plants and fungi might work together in a synergistic fashion to produce specific psychoactive or therapeutic effects. We discussed the entourage effect in the context of both cannabis and magic mushrooms, and whether such effects are known or likely to be discovered. We talked about other psychedelics, including DMT, 5-MeO-DMT, and other DMT analogs that Andrew and his team have created and are working on. We discussed how he went from academia to patent law to founding startups like Camtech, and how he went about creating a company from scratch that funds and directs a lot of research across multiple academic science labs. So he kind of described how how some of that worked, which was pretty interesting. We also touched on other topics in psychedelic science, including the prospect of developing novel psychedelic drugs, developing non-hallucinogenic psychedelic drug analogs, and some of the details of how these various drugs differ in terms of their chemistry and functional properties. As always, if you enjoy the content I'm producing on this podcast, please like, share, and subscribe. You can share a link to your favorite episode with a friend or family member. You can subscribe to my free weekly newsletter at mindandmatter.substack.com, where you will find the podcast, where you can see some of my long-form science content that pulls together and synthesizes some of the content across different episodes of the show and other interesting research that I'm reading about that week. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can make Mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Andrew Chidane. Andrew Shadane, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Can you start off by just telling everyone a little bit about who you are and what your scientific background is before going into Camtech? Sure. Um, I'm Andrew Shadane, and I started uh, studying science at Princeton University. Um, I started out studying uh, neuropsychology, um, addiction and reward in the Bartley Hobel Lab. And uh, I was looking at um, uh, models for addiction and the paper that came out of that was showing that sugar is addictive through some of the same pathways as opiate drugs. Um, even as an undergrad, that led me to a fascination with the underlying chemicals and molecules. And so I uh, actually graduated with a degree in chemistry from Princeton and then went on to do a PhD at Cornell um, in chemistry. 
Uh, that work was um, very um, academic, um, not a lot of real world applications, but um, I spent five years learning how to leave absolutely no stone unturned um, with Peter Wolzanski um, at Cornell. And um, at the end of that time, uh, for better or worse, um, my plans to become a chemistry professor sort of disappeared because I didn't think that I was possibly smart enough to be a chemistry professor working for this super brilliant chemist, Pete Wolzanski. Um, and so I looked for some other area where I might you know, find a, a better fit. Um, I started taking classes at Cornell Law School and uh, ultimately decided to make a transition into patent law. Um, so after getting my PhD, uh, I moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts and started working for a patent firm called Finnegan um, as a technical specialist um, advising on chemical matters and immediately realized that now I was a smart chemist because um, to take the chemical skill set and move it over into the legal profession, uh, now I've got like a superpower, especially mm. coming from a group um, that focuses on um, you know really digging down deep um, and leaving no stone unturned. Um, so I stayed with Finnegan for five years and went to law school at uh, GW Law School in Washington, D.C. Um, and after I was done with law school, um, I made uh, another move into more entrepreneurial waters and started a company called Swim Spray, which gets the chlorine off of hair and skin. Hmm. It is the absolute best uh, solution for getting chlorine off of you after you swim. Um, but it turns out that there was not a tremendous market uh, for telling swimmers that uh, they smelled like chlorine and needed to get the chlorine off their <laughs> hair and skin. Um, from there, um, uh, since, you know, swim spray wasn't uh, paying the bills at the time and I had some interest from some of my, uh, uh clients and, and people that knew I did patent law. Um, I went into private practice, patent law, started a patent firm, um, which I ran for about five years. And it was through that patent firm that I connected with a company called Ebu. Um, and Ebu uh, was a cannabis company that was doing really innovative work that uh, really captured my interest in a variety of different ways. One, looking at the chemical composition of cannabis and not just calling it weed. Mm -hmm. um, and then two, I had a longstanding curiosity with the patentability of new forms of natural products, um, new combinations that were possible after looking at the chemical composition. Um, so after a while of you know being Ebu's uh, patent agent, or patent attorney um, while running uh, my patent firm, um, I made the transition over to Ebu full-time as their director of uh, innovation. Um, then eventually, uh, Ebu got bought by Canopy Growth, um, and I was left looking for the next thing. Um, and fortunately, at that time, you know, living in the Pacific Northwest, um, magic mushrooms grow in my backyard. <laughs> um, I sort of started asking myself whether, you know, there are other sort of un underappreciated molecules and chemicals or, um, you know, uh, you know, other natural sources that are sort of treated like one molecule, but really have a lot more uh, going on in them um, when you look closer. Uh, so I decided to look more closely at magic mushrooms. And that was probably 2016, 2017. And I've been working on that and all sorts of other questions and roads that have opened up because of that. Did it, did it really just sort of occur to you to think about magic mushrooms in that kind of spontaneous way you just described, or had you been, had they been on your mind longer than that? I think it was a combination of things. One, the, um, you know, the PhD experience of, you know, know absolutely everything that's going on chemically all the time. Uh, don't ignore anything that matters. Um, plus, um, how I had just come off of several years uh, working in cannabis. Um, and uh, one of the things that was coming out in cannabis at the time was that it's not just THC, there's mm -hmm. these other molecules, and we were really at the forefront of looking at that. And so those two things kind of came together with magic mushrooms and led me to ask, uh, well, is that just psilocybin? And if it's not just psilocybin, could maybe some of those other molecules matter? Yeah. Let's actually talk about some cannabis stuff first to segue into what you're doing now. Um, and one of the concepts I want to talk about with you in particular is this idea of an entourage effect or different entourage effects. So can you break that down for people with respect to cannabis? What, what do we mean when we start talking about entourage effects? Oh boy. Um, I'll now I'll be another person pretending to know. Um, I, I think at a high level, everybody understands what it means. It means that, um, you know, the sum of the chemicals that are, that are in the plant or in the formulation that are consumed by the user work together to produce an effect that is 
uh, distinct from what you would get from an individual molecule or um, even by what you would guess you would get by looking at the different individual molecules um, and that they work to together in this entourage, or I've heard other people call it a symphony, um, you know, to create, you know, a, an effect that's bigger than the sum of the parts. And is this just like a cool idea or is there any kind of precedent for this any, anywhere in nature? I think it's both. It's, it's, it's the in between that's gray. And that's, what's so fun about it for me is that, you know, you're, you're chasing after something, um, and you know, it's there. Um, but you can't, it's the connecting of the dots that's the challenge. And so we, you know, I'm 100% convinced that there is a quote entourage effect. Mm -hmm. I think anyone will tell you that, you know, the different strains of cannabis result in a different um, experience um, when consumed by the user. Um, we've also shown this using cellular pharmacology um, assays and whatnot. Um, in the magic mushroom space, which is where I've been focusing recently, um, there are some pretty you know, conclusive studies showing that mushroom extracts have an effect that is different from psilocybin. And so mm. you, you know there's a difference, um, but um, predicting it and harnessing it and using it in a way uh, to get what you want, thats I think that's going to be a long-term challenge. Yeah, that, that's always been my intuition, a very strong intuition in the way that I've always explained it on the cannabis side to people, which is that entourage effects are almost certainly real to some extent it's just that no one has sort of parsed what the specific ones are. No one's sort of like decoded what that chemical language is. But there's many examples in nature where plants and other creatures are using chemistry, combinatorial effects mm -hmm. with chemistry to achieve things that aren't achievable or not as achievable as any of the single molecules on their own. So, so we sort of know this stuff is out there. We just haven't like fully, fully decoded it. Yes. And I mean, I think it's a big project. Nature tends to be uh, very sophisticated um, and very, very good uh, at putting together these sorts of cocktails. Um, the example that I use a lot is that um, I can't wake up in the morning and not have my cup of coffee. I mean, my my five-year-old has learned how to bring dad a cup of coffee before <laughs> it's okay uh, to, you know, get the morning routine going. Um, but, you know, when there's no coffee in the house, I'm not looking for a caffeine pill. Mm -hmm. um, and I would I would bet that um, the effects of coffee, um, you know, in some quantifiable way are different from caffeine, um, that probably the, um, you know, terpenes or phytols or what have you in the coffee, other molecules modulate the effects that, you know, quantifiably would cause you a different experience with those molecules vis-a-vis -a, -vis a caffeine pill. Mm -hmm. So in cannabis, I would say you know, the one clear example of an interactive effect between two or more compounds is THC and CBD. We know that THC is the main psychoactive component of cannabis. It has been known, known to be that for a long time. It activates the CB1 receptor to have most of its effects. CBD interacts with that same receptor, but in a different way. And so there's a, there's sort of a known mechanistic basis for why the THC CBD ratio would be really important for mediating some kind of, um, entourage like effect. And, and we know from various studies that, you know, having CBD in combination with THC can mitigate some of the, the ne negative side effects of THC, for example. The other thing that that's sort of a hot topic these days is the idea that terpenes, the, the aromatic compounds also found in cannabis and other plants might modulate the effects of THC based on your background and what's been done. Some of it's maybe in the published literature. Mm -hmm. Some of it's maybe not in the published literature. Is there any clear evidence in your mind out there that the terpenes are likely causing uh, that there are specific entourage effects involving THC in any of the cannabis terpenes? Oh, I, I can say for sure that there is. Um, and we can come at it a bunch of different ways. Uh, for one, um, I think it's pretty well uh, figured out that no one likes pure THC. Like I think, and, I, and there was a, it was a, uh, Marinol, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah. And there have been products made, you know, both in the pharmaceutical and the recreational market, you know, um, that are pure THC. Get rid of all that other stuff. Do Western medicine, just THC, and nobody likes it. Um, and I think the principal side effect there is uh, anxiety, paranoia. Mm. Um, and so um, that right there tells you there's an entourage effect because people 
do sort of like smoking weed. Um, and when you formulate the THC with other molecules into your gummies or mints or whatever it is, those formulations, people really like those. Um, so getting back to THC and CBD, um, yeah, CBD reacts at the same receptor, the CB1 receptor that THC does, and it modulates the way that THC behaves at that receptor. Um, connecting that to a better user experience is a little bit more difficult, but now we've just basically proved the entourage effect, right? We know at a cellular level that when CBD um, uh, is in the mix, uh, THC is actually less potent at that receptor, but it, it turns into a full agonist. So you um, you get less of a response for you know a certain amount, but uh, you can get higher higher up in the in the response mm. curve. Oh, so, so on its own, THC is what we call a partial agonist, and you're yes. saying in the presence of CBD, it's actually a full agonist. Uh, I think it's a full agonist, or at least it tends towards a full agonist uh, with, with CBD in the mix, and that's that allosteric modulation at the CB1 receptor. I see. And so you think that's likely to be true for some of the terpenes as well, something like that? I happen to know that it's true with cannabis terpenes and cannabis ligands. Um, I don't have the data in front of me, and it's been a while since I was in the cannabis industry, but we did you know, quantifiably using cellular assays show that cannabis ligand plus terpene equals different response. I mean, in many cases, you know, I, I can remember that the potency would go up, you know, four to tenfold, which wow. is big. Wow. So that does, that is at least consistent with the intuition that many cannabis consumers have, which is that there's some kind of difference in potency, which doesn't appear to be completely explained by difference in the absolute levels of THC present. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if it were just THC, everything would be the same, right? And there seems to be a pretty big difference all the way from I don't like this and it makes me anxious to, wow, this really calms my nerves. Interesting. So you've sort of had this interesting trajectory from chemistry to law, working in the cannabis space, mentioning that mushrooms were growing in your backyard. Do you know what species are actually literally growing in your backyard? Uh, Psilocybe cyanescens. Okay. So yep. those are super potent ones, correct? Uh, rumor has it. Um, I think the data says that, you know, well, I mean, that, that's actually the problem with all magic mushrooms, right? Is that, um, you know, huge variability, right? So, I mean, for any given species, is that species more potent than another one? Like maybe on average, but for a given mushroom or parts of the mushroom, you can be, you know, a, a tenfold difference one way or an, another. Um, mm -hmm. It is called the potent psilocybe. Um, so uh, I think that tells you something there. Um, but I mean, in terms of, I think, um, you know, what everybody would point to is the most potent. I think it's still the psilocybe azarescens, which is another Pacific Northwest mushroom. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of mushrooms out here. Um, so why don't we get into cam tech? How did you, how did you get into cam tech and can you just talk about what, what cam tech is and why you started it? Sure. Um, I mean, this really gets to, and you, you know, you pointed out, you know, I kind of jumped around in my career a lot. You know, my, my wife has always encouraged me to just do what I like doing, um, you know, that the results will kind of come. And so, I mean, that was largely um, Ebu. Um, you know, I was in patent law and like, you know, what would be my dream client in chemical patent law? Like, oh, it would be fun to go and mess around with this sort of growing industry over here. Um, and, you know, so when, you know, when my you know role um, at Ebu and in cannabis sort of came to an end, um, there, there I had this other fascinating little, uh, little organism growing there in my yard. Um, so, I mean, like the proximity to it, um, that was definitely part of it that I could see these things growing in the fall. Um, also, um, super interesting class of molecules. No one really understood them. You know, they had been sort of, you know, pushed out of uh, scientific research for quite some time. But, you know, in 2016, 2017, there was just a little hint that um, these could be really um, important. Um, you know, as, as medicines, um, you know, for treating, you know, some conditions, I think at the time, you know, depression, anxiety, and, and addiction, um, had been, um, hinted at or, or shown at least in some models. Um, and then the chemist in me was, you know, geez, could this possibly be kind of the same thing that I've seen in cannabis? You know, are there other molecules in there and what do they do? And, you know, I search the internet a little bit and people will tell you that there are, oh, these are more visual and these are more body. And it just sort of started feeling like cannabis again, which felt like another uh, another puzzle and another one that um, people hadn't started playing with yet. So I could play with it all by myself for a while. Yeah. So how did you actually go about starting a company around that? 
Um, well, I had just exited Ebu, um, so I had plenty of money, um, didn't need to work anymore. Um, and running a company um, by yourself tends not to be terribly expensive. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I spent a lot of time sitting in my garage office, um, reading all the papers that I could, um, you know, coming up with some hypotheses for what some of these molecules ought to be, um, which is a good starting point. If you're going to start looking at the chemotypes of the, of the mushrooms, you at least want to kind of know what you're looking for, like... Um, a mass number um, or, you know, some other uh, characteristics of those molecules that could be identified by, by spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, um, you know, a lot of uh, sort of paper chemistry um, for the first year. Um, I also learned about mushrooms and mushroom cultivation and the different... Um, you know, uh, substrates and the different processes and, you know, growing mushrooms. I took Paul Stamitz's, uh, mushroom cultivation seminar, <laughs> um, you know, read all the books I could on magic mushrooms and other psychedelics and what receptors and serotonin, um, and, you know, started coming up with, and I guess this is how I tend to do things, started coming up with questions. Yeah. Um, you know, like one that I remember dawning on me was, um, you know, if you look at the absolute um, uh, chemical composition of mushroom substrates and compost and grain and whatnot, you, you know, the first thing that kind of dawned on me was how do we mass balance this? You know, like how, what is my yield of mushrooms going to be? Um, you know, because how many nitrogen atoms do I have? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you look at all the sort of composting and mushroom growing books, like it, it doesn't quite add up mm. how you could, you know, you know, and, and those sorts of things bother me because there's no way around conservation of mass in my world. Um, and so, I mean, that was, you know, one example of one question, the other obviously being what are the other molecules in there and, you know, what, what do they do? Um, the bluing reaction yeah. uh, was another one that at the time really fascinated me. And I started messing around with that. And can, that, can you describe what that is for people? Sure. Um, uh, when um, many species of magic mushrooms get bruised or bumped into or cut, um, they tend to blue in color. Um, and it's a noticeable, you know, sort of blue indigo color. Um, separate topic, there are different shades of blue, and sometimes it's green. And why is that? Mm. And you can see how it morphs into other questions. Um, but what is that blue stuff? Um, that was kind of the question at the time. Um, and so that that's actually led to some really f fruitful collaborations, uh, in particular with uh, Dirk Hoffmeister, um, who I think um, would probably be the world's expert in the bluing reaction now. Um, and it turns out that uh, the bluing reaction is actually um, due to oxidation of these psychedelic molecules. Um, and through the oxidation, they can connect themselves or couple together into dimers and oligomers. And it's those dimers and oligomers that um, give it the blue color. And then um, I think kind of the funny punchline to that is, and, you know, this is, you know, all, all the credit goes to Dirk Hoffmeister here, um, you know, maybe these mushrooms aren't making, you know, these uh, uh, tryptamines or, or psilocybin to get people high. Mm. Um, maybe um, they're making them so that when they get damaged, they can quickly put them together into um, one of these dimers um, that then can bind to protein or cause some sort of reaction as a defense mechanism. I see. That's interesting. I, I did want to ask you, like, you know, ecologically, why would an organism make something that happens to be psychoactive in a mammalian context? You know, one hypothesis is they actually, you know, want, evolutionarily speaking, to be psychoactive. But another that you just hinted at is that they're doing something else with it. And you talked about defense, which seems to be a theme in the plant world when mm -hmm. you think about these molecules, whether it's cannabis or psilocybe mushrooms. So can you, can you unpack that a little bit more about why the mushroom would even want to make these molecules, so to speak? Sure, sure. The, the, the place I always have to remind myself to start here is that the mushrooms don't care about you. <laughs> they could care less about your personal experience or your, your mystical experience or anything like that. They're, they're off there being mushrooms. Um, so to, to think that the mushrooms are making these molecules for me, um, I think is a very, um, well, that's a very you know, popular human view um, that they must be doing it for me. Um, the, the defense mechanism tends to fit a lot better, I think, because, you know, these mushrooms want to stay alive so that they can, you know, pass on their genes and uh, continue to grow um, in their environment. And so looking for like those sorts of uh, defensive mechanisms, I think makes more sense when asking why the mushrooms are doing it. Um, and there, you know, it's kind of hard to find a reason why the mushroom would make psilocybin. I mean, in people, um, sure, there's a, a pretty intense um, uh, uh, experience that the person goes through, but there's really no toxicology problems with that. So that can't be the answer there. And I think the same with, 
you know, at least other mammals. Um, so, I mean, there you, you really can't come up with a good reason why the mushroom would make psilocybin or bayassistin or anything like that. Um, but in terms of uh, these dimers, um, one of the hypotheses that we're investigating is that the dimers, um, you know, might be paralytics um, or might um, have some toxicity. Uh, we know that they bind um, to proteins. Uh, the dimers do, the blue dimers. Um, so all of that fits. Um, and it would make quite a bit of sense because when would the mushroom want to sort of launch this defense mechanism? Well, when something's eating it or damaging it. And when does this start happening? Oh, well, the, the, the mushroom tissue gets damaged. And through the damage, now the uh, molecules can get oxidized. And then as they get oxidized, they become susceptible to the dimerization reaction, which makes these blue dimers and oligomers. And so it's sort of like an on-demand defense system for them. I see. And when you say dimerize and oligomerize, you just mean individual molecules literally starting to link up and creating larger structures. Exactly like that. Dimer is two, oligomer is more than two. <laughs> Interesting. So, so it could literally be some kind of physical defense barrier thing. Yes. Uh, and it makes a lot more sense than the mushrooms caring about my mental health. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so getting into some of the chemistry now, can you unpack for people like what is psilocybin as a chemical structure and how is it actually synthesized within the biochemical pathways of these mushrooms? Let me see if I can do that off the top of my head. So psilocybin is a pretty simple molecule. It's a tryptamine molecule, which means that, um, you know, it's a, it's two rings fused to one another, very similar to, uh, tryptophan, um, which we have in our bodies, which I believe is the first uh, part of the biosynthesis in that tryptophan gets decarboxylated or loses its carboxylic acid group to make tryptamine. Um, then the tryptamine um, has another oxygen atom added. Um, so making psilocybin would be added in the four position of the tryptamine. And then that part of the molecule gets a phosphate group put on it. It gets phosphorylated. And then the um, ethanolamine part of the molecule gets a first methyl group put on it. And that's how we make bayassistin. Um, before we put the methyl group on it, it would be nor bayassistin. But one methyl group is bayassistin. Then it gets meth methylated again, and you get psilocybin. Um, there is another molecule after that called arugacin, which has a third methyl group on it. Um, but it is unclear right now how that third methyl group gets on there. Mm. So I, I'm seeing an analogy here with cannabis where you've got these sort of uh, biochemical pathways where one molecule gets turned into another one. And so depending on the growth characteristics or the um, level of maturation that the plant, or in this case, the mushrooms at when you harvest it and process it, it's going to uh, dictate to some extent the ratio of some of these different compounds, how how far on the pathway you've gone. And so they're, they're all sort of like one or two steps from each other, right? They are all definitely still one or two steps from one another. And it makes perfect sense when you look at a scheme, you know, that, you know, compound uh, one goes to two to three to four to five. And they actually kind of the, the phosphorylated ones, bayassistin and nor bayassistin, psilocybin and psilocin, arugacin and uh, four hydroxy trimethyl tryptomonium, um, those actually convert back and forth into one another. Um, but as simple as that scheme is, um, this idea of, oh, well, we can just pick them earlier and get a different ratio, um, that still needs to get worked out. Mm. Um, and it's quite possible that different species of magic mushrooms have different forms or amounts of enzymes um, that you know cause each one of these little steps to go a little bit faster, a little bit slower, or if they're in equilibrium, tends to shift the equilibrium a little bit one way or another. And so I think those things, um, I mean, if one of those things complicates the, the situation, like imagine six or seven of them all complicating it at the same time. And so how to get you know, one molecule out of it is a, a hard question. Right. And so what are, so you mentioned some of these other compounds. Can you, what, what is known about things like baocystin and some of these other molecules? Do we know, I mean, beyond the, the raw chemistry, do we know if they have psychoactive effects or interact with interesting receptors that might be um, of interest therapeutically? Uh, first answer is we know very, very little. Um, and, and frankly, like no one was looking at these um, uh, in 2016, 2017, which is why this became a great garage project for me. <laughs> um, since then, there's been a, a ton of great work done, and we're you know gaining ground quickly. Um, but if you think about sort of the you know obvious uh, set of molecules that you would expect to be in the magic mushrooms, you would have you know zero, one, two, or three methyl groups up on the ethanolamine arm, and then it could be phosphorylated or not phosphorylated. So now you have a set of eight. 
Um, and those eight would be um, norbeacistin and 4-hydroxytryptamine that has no methyls on there. Um, and then you would have baacistin and norcilosin, and then you would have psilocybin and psilocin, and then you would have erugosin and 4-hydroxytrimethyltryptamonium to fill out the set of eight. Um, at the time, people knew about psilocybin and psilocin and had studied its cellular pharmacology and, you know, 2016, 2017, um, you know, folks at Johns Hopkins had done a lot of nice work and Compass Pathways was moving it towards clinical trials. The other molecules, uh, almost nothing, um, you know, um, but since then, um, uh, some folks have synthesized uh, baocystin and erugosin. Um, uh, Alex Sherwood um, at the USONA Institute um, had a nice paper, I think it was 2017, maybe 2018, um, with those syntheses. And, um, you know, baocystin has at least um, shown some really interesting results. Um, so baocystin is a prodrug of norcilosin. Um, so just like psilocybin isn't the active molecule in magic mushrooms, it hydrolyzes into psilocin. Mm -hmm. um, Baocystin does the same thing with norcilosin. So the, the active component is this hydrolyzed molecule that's liberated by um, the prodrug when you consume it. Um, and so if you look at the cellular pharmacology of norcilosin, um, it's arguably more potent in functional assays at the serotonin 2A receptor than psilocin is. I see. Um, so meaning you're, when you say functional assay, you mean doing experiments to measure its receptor interaction directly? Yes. Yeah, so um, in, in vitro, uh, you can do a binding affinity study. You know, how well does this ligand compete with a radio ligand? How well does it bind to the receptor? Or a functional assay is, um, you know, looking at fluorescence to see how well that ligand makes the neuron fire. Mm, yeah. um, and they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, um, but in any case, uh, norcilosin binds really well to the serotonin 2A receptor. And um, in both um, binding affinity uh, uh, studies and all also um, you know, is functionally very potent at the serotonin 2A receptor. Um, so, you know, just taking that data there, you would expect, hey, we have another super potent psilocin-like psychedelic in the mushrooms. Um, but the rub there is that when you do another test, um, the head twitch um, uh, experiments, um, which is the gold standard for is this a trippy molecule, um, the mice don't shake their heads. I see. Uh, and so the head twitch is basically you give, uh, you give a known... You give a molecule with known psychedelic effects in a human to a mouse, and because the mouse can't tell you if it's tripping and it's kind of hard to discern, what people have discovered is that they kind of have this head twitch response where they very quickly twitch their head, and that's our proxy for whether or not something might be hallucinogenic in a human being. Yes, that is the state of the art. You, you give it to a mouse, and if the mouse twitches its head, there is a very strong correlation between a mouse twitching its head and a person having a psychedelic experience. Is um, And how... How strong is that correlation? Are there any instances where we know something is hallucinogenic, but it doesn't do the head twitch, or they do the head twitch, but we know that it's not hallucinogenic in humans? Uh, I think there are a couple of counterexamples, but I mean, that still makes it just an unbelievably great assay. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and I'm going to get this wrong, I think it might be lysergamide. So like it's one of the relatives of LSD, um, is a potent serotonin 2A agonist. Um, but when you give it to a mouse, uh, no head twitch response. And then I'm not sure if there's an anecdotal evidence about people eating it. And so this molecule that you've described, norcilosin, is this, so it's apparently potentially more potent than psilocybin. It's activating serotonin 2A receptors, the so-called psychedelic receptor. Is this, is this molecule tending to be in very minute quantities in the mushrooms, or are there some species that actually have uh, a good amount of it? Um, both. Um, uh, for one, in, in, in some mushrooms, it's you know barely there. So, I mean, it's definitely a minor uh, tryptamine. Um, I think in uh, other samples and other sets of mushrooms, it can be uh, up to a third um, of the tryptamines that are present, which is a very appreciable amount. And um, if you look at you know, some data for psilocybe azarescens mushrooms, you know, where it's present uh, as about a third, a quarter, a third of the uh, tryptamines there. Um, the absolute amount is considerable because uh, hmm. remember, that's a mushroom that has a lot of these tryptamines. And so, you know, uh, a third of a lot is more than you would get in a less potent mushroom. Yeah. So azarescens, that's the one that's anecdotally reported to be one of the trippiest species out there. And so there seems to be something that, that is potentially lining up here. Uh, yeah, that would be another, um, uh, another piece of very anecdotal evidence that I would put into the, um, I guess, entourage effect bucket. 
Um, uh, the other thing about um, bay assistin norcelosin and the not trippiness is that there is actually a report of somebody taking pure bay assistin, mm. and it's not just somebody. Um, it's uh, Paul Stamets, who normally I would dismiss, you know, an N equals one self-administered study where someone's eating drugs. Um, but this is Paul Stamets. He, he knows magic <laughs> mushrooms and he knows about, um, you know, what liftoff means. And he was on the, the Joe Rogan podcast uh, talking about how he was, you know, very anxious for, you know, some reason. Um, and uh, I think one of his trips had, you know, had fallen apart at the last minute. But he decided to do this Bay Assistant test anyway. And under the guidance of a physician, um, took pure Bay Assistant and was waiting for the psychic experience that Paul Stamets probably knows better than anyone. Um, and it didn't happen. Um, hmm. but he felt an overall sense of complete calm and peace with the world. Interesting. Um, and, uh, so, you know, that's where that makes sense in terms of the serotonin 2A activity. Um, and, um, it also, you know, it, N equals one, but corroborates this, you know, corroborates what the mouse is doing. I mean, the mouse isn't shaking its head. Paul Stamets isn't tripping. There's this ser powerful serotonergic effect, and Paul's feeling calm. Um, so, so remind me, so Bay Assistant is doing what at, at the different receptors? Bay Assistant's doing nothing, um, because Bay Assistant is a pro-drug. Okay, um, oh, I see. Okay, so, so that's the norcilosin. It turns into norcilosin. Oh, yeah, exactly. Okay, so no uh, no psychedelic effect in this uh, N equals 1 Paul Stamets experiment, yep. even though it's activating 5-HT2A. Yes, which we know from cellular assays. Interesting. Interesting. And so is, is it uh, is it a mystery at that point? We don't really know what's going on there? Oh, well, I mean, we, we know more that's going on than ever now. Now it's, you know, okay, can we connect the dots even further? Um, you know, so, okay, so we know no HTR in mice. We know that it has certain serotonin 2A activity. Um, what else could be going on here? Um, wouldn't it be great to get that molecule into people? Um, because if it really is um, a, um, sh a, a fast-acting um, anxiolytic molecule um, that doesn't have, you know, really any, um, you know, toxicity issues or downside, uh, that could be a good drug. Interesting. And are those studies underway? Are people doing them? Uh, we have some studies underway um, uh, with uh, norcilosin and other norcilosin prodrugs. Interesting. So as a, as a, before getting to that, as, um, as a chemist and sort of at the level of pharmacology, how could it be that one drug activates 5-HT2A, causes psychedelic effects, another drug also activates the same receptor and does not? What a great question. Um, it's one of my favorite questions, and we're working on it. But, uh, you know, uh, working um, is the key there. Um, and I think that's where we get into there's got to be some sort of entourage effect, right? Mm. Like, it, it obviously isn't just banging on 2A, right? Because then anytime we push the 2A button, we would get HTR and people would trip, right? Um, so what else is going on there? There has to be some sort of, you know, I, I like the piano analogy where it's like, you know, you're not just playing one note, but playing different notes, you start making chords, um, you know, call it the entourage effect or whatever, but it's this sort of multifactorial sum of the pharmacology that creates the experience. And so Norcelotion is a very dramatic example because you basically turn off the property that you think it should have no matter what. Um, but I think that to a lesser extent, those sorts of effects um, also explain, you know, the, hey, this mushroom is more visual than this mushroom. This one has more of a body load, you know, um, you know, I'm more euphoric on this mushroom, so on and so forth. I think that's probably the spectrum of effects that are possible by modulating the pharmacology. Interesting. What about um, MAOIs, monoamine oxidase, oxidase inhibitors? Have those been um, isolated from any psilocybe species? Very, very recently. Again, Dirk Hoffmeister, who I, I think is probably the expert in uh, magic mushroom biochemistry, his group has uh, found um, a, a collection of um, uh, beta carbolines um, in magic mushrooms, and those are monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So these are the same things that are found in an ayahuasca brew? Um, I am not sure if it is the same monoamine oxidase inhibitor. I would guess that it's not, but it's the exact same idea that in ayahuasca, you have DMT that gets chewed up by your body before it can do anything by monoamine oxidase. But if you co-administer it, and I think it's like some sort of Syrian rhubarb uh, that has it in the natural um, preparation, um, if you co-administer the DMT with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, that shuts down the monoamine oxidase activity so that the DMT can go and you know do its thing. 
Yeah, and that's why DMT can be orally active if it's consumed with some of these inhibitors. Yes. And why is that interesting? Could that be the basis? Would you naturally think that's a basis for an entourage effect in mushrooms based on what else is inside these things? It, it, you know, I would be shocked if, well, okay, a lot of things go on, going on here. For one, um, there's really not that much of the beta carbolines in Dirk Hofmeister's data. But again, these mushrooms are highly variable, like, every way you look at them. So that's, that, that doesn't say anything about the batch of mushrooms that's, you know, growing on the coast of Oregon, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe they have a lot of beta carbolines and beta carbolines should affect the pharmacology considerably, um, at least insofar as monoamine oxidase is important in breaking down these molecules, which brings up another question, right? Like how important is monoamine oxidase in breaking down the molecules that you find in the magic mushrooms? Mm -hmm. Um, now, unlike DMT, all the tryptamines and the magic mushrooms have a, a four substitution with an oxygen atom. It could you know, either be a hydroxyl group or a, or a phosphate group. Um, that group tends to um, inhibit monoamine oxidase from chewing up the molecule in the first place. Um, so looking at it that way, maybe the monoamine oxidase isn't that important, but you really don't know if the monoamine oxidase isn't affecting some other part of the breakdown of the molecule or the breakdown of some other molecule that is um, uh, modulating the effect. So um, this all gets back to the overarching theme of, you know, look, you know, if you're going to look at a cocktail of molecules and ask what it does, you know, you're going to have to account for all of those molecules in the cocktail, not just focus on one. Mm-hmm. And to what extent are you guys at Camtech and in your research collaborations, are you work, are you synthesizing these compounds de novo and working with pure preparations versus doing extracts that contain various combinations? Um, we're doing both. Um, I think Camtech's sort of light bulb, um, or our contribution to this industry, you know, at least on the magic mushroom side back in 2016 was, um, you know, look at the, the whole composition. Um, compositions are always molecules, right? We can't pick up a mushroom and call it psilocybin or say that it is just psilocybin. Um, but then to my earlier point about how these cocktails with all of these molecules are really, really complicated. How can we possibly understand that? Um, And so uh, we're doing it very methodically where start out with synthesizing and rigorously characterizing one of the molecules pure. Um, And that alone is a step forward because a lot of these molecules were either not available pure at all um, or they were mischaracterized. Um, A lot of folks tend to overlook um, different forms of the molecules um, and different solvates or different salt forms of the molecules, which affects the molecular weight, which affects the, you know, all of the calculations based on molecular weight, which tends to be, you know, all of the biological um, considerations. Um, so we, we start out by making pure versions of each of the molecules, then studying what the pure molecules do, um, and then moving on to how one uh, molecule how it would affect the pharmacology of another one. So take psilocin, right? The active from psilocybin. How does a little norcilocin affect that? It's got to be different. Um, and then, you know, let's find something that we can quantify and then run with that. What does that do? And so in, in the psilocybin trials that are the most famous and publicized, are those have those tended to be um, studies that have used pure psilocybin that they administer to patients? Or are they using extracts that also contain at least small quantities of other compounds? I think, I, you know, I always hate using the word all, um, but I think all um, of the clinical data is from pure psilocybin. I know that there are folks working on um, getting approval, um, you know, in Canada, um, uh, and I think, you know, in some places in the U.S. for using um, natural extracts or, uh, uh, you know, naturally sourced psilocybin. But I think still today, all of the human data um, for psilocybin um, is from pure synthetic psilocybin. Interesting. And have you guys done much work to characterize if they're to a to um, try and like standardize cultivation so that the mushrooms growing harvest by harvest are relatively consistent? And have you done any work to um, you know rigorously characterize differences between psilocybe mushroom species? Uh, no to the first question. Yes to the second question. Um, standardizing the um, chemotype of the mushrooms. I know there are folks working on it. It's just not us. Um, you know, we have the one 
um, partnership where we're looking at biochemistry and um, actual mushrooms. Um, and you know what we're doing there is your second uh, point, which is trying to get um, a rigorously analytical view as to what different you know sort of chemical fingerprints or chemotypes there are across um, different species and really different samples of mushrooms. Um, because even for a given species, there tends to be a lot of variability. I see. So we mentioned, um, DMT briefly before in terms of the chemistry, when we think mm -hmm. about psilocybin, the active compound there that, uh, you metabolize, uh, is psilocin. That's the one that actually causes mm -hmm. the psychedelic effects. And then there's DMT. How do those differ in terms of the chemistry and how is it that such a small difference can lead to such a stark difference in the subjective effects? Um, it's exactly what I was talking about before when we were talking about the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Mm -hmm. So the difference between DMT and psilocin. So let's compare active to active. The only difference there is um, an OH group or a hydroxyl group in the four position of the tryptamine. Um, but it's the inclusion of that you know oxygen atom there in the four position that seems to um, lessen the ability of monoamine oxidase to break down the molecule. I see. So just that one tiny thing can have a big effect in terms of how it's how it's broken down. Absolutely. Yeah. It uh, lessens the ability of monoamine oxidase to break down the molecule. So you've got something orally active that tends to sit around in the blood for four plus hours. And how does DMT compare to 5-MeO-DMT? Um, so 5-MeO-DMT just has a 5-methoxy group um, added to the DMT molecule, if you want to think about it that way, using DMT as the base. Um, and it seems as though, and I'm sure this is in the literature, um, that that substitution in the five position is not as effective as the substitution in the four position at inhibiting monoamine oxidase, which would explain why 5-MeO DMT is not um, orally active. I see. Interesting. Interesting. And are you guys doing, are you guys doing any work with DMT or 5-MeO? Not those molecules specifically. We tend to stay away from the Schedule One molecules. Um, we, we use them as comparators, but everybody's working on those. Um, but we've made a whole ton of analogs for each of those. So I mean, not five, not five meo DMT, but five meo with all sorts of different groups all over the place, and then compare it and see if we can figure out why the differences matter. Interesting. Is there anything uh, interesting that you found with any of those so far that you can talk about? Sure. Um, I mean, for one thing, like take DMT or 5-MeO DMT. So the, the DMT stands for dimethyltryptamine. So on that ethanolamine arm, you have two methyl groups. Um, if you start messing around with those methyl groups, um, you can make an orally active molecule. Mm. Um, uh, why? Um, not entirely sure. Um, uh, because I was just telling you before that it, you know, talking about psilocin, it's that substitution in the four position that shuts down monoamine oxidase. But you can also mess around with the um, the alkyl groups on the ethanolamine arm um, and change this non-orally active molecule into an orally active one. Does it appear to have the same sort of intensity and duration of effects, or is that different as well? The problem is, is that right now we'd have to ask the mouse. I see. Um, it, so so there, all you have is the head twitch. Well, and, there, and, and I hate to over-interpret that data. Yeah. Um, uh, not in the 5-MeO DMT DMT space. Like, I mean, we have created some versions of um, actually psilocin um, that look like they are blowing the mouse's mind compared to the standard, which would be like psilocin. Like, um, but what you're looking at is the number of times this mouse is shaking its head in like a 30-minute window. I see. Um, so or, it's shaking it more. A lot more. Wow. Um, or, you know, how little of the drug you have to give in order to get the mouse to reach mm. a threshold of head shaking. Um, but again... Uh, how, how, how much do you want to extrapolate, you know, the mouse is shaking its head with, right, right, you know, right. curing this guy's PTSD? Yeah. Well, a question that's springing to mind here that um, I realized that you're very uniquely positioned to talk about is you're creating and extracting and using some of these psychedelic analogs, drug analogs of Schedule One controlled substances. How does the legality come into this? When does... Um, you know, what's the legal situation if something is not the Schedule One drug, but is a close analog and appears to have psychoactive effects? How, how does that, like, are those things legal? Do they easily become Schedule One? How does all of that work? Uh, great question. I actually, I mean, I think it's a little bit of a legal gray area, and I'll tell you sort of, you know, where we've drawn the line. Um, uh, so Schedule One is pretty much outright prohibition for any reason whatsoever. If you have that molecule, we will assume that you are a bad person and you are going to jail, mm -hmm. um, unless you have permission from the government, right? And and so we have a couple labs where we have 
that sort of permission for the Schedule 1 molecules. These other not scheduled molecules, which I would call analogs, um, there is a federal analog act. Um, those are not Schedule 1 and not illegal for research purposes, right? Um, however, um, if you were to buy them with the intent to eat them, mm. um, or if you had the intent to distribute them, you know, if you got... You know, if you were in downtown Seattle and you were on your way into a club and you had a gram of this research chemical on you, you don't really have plausible de deniability that I like, see. oh, I was on my way to the lab. <laughs> um, but we, we keep all of ours in a safe um, in a chemical lab. They all get delivered to a, the, the chemical receiving office and then, you know, cataloged and kept in a safe. And um, one thing that we are very, very strict about at Camtech is like there's no eating the molecules. Like mm -hmm. we, are, we are not Alexander Shulgin. Um, I respect that guy's research uh, tremendously, um, but you know we got to color inside the lines here because we can't risk, you know, some sort of disaster. And we can do plenty of science, you know, playing by the rules. I see. So to summarize, the general rule is that if a novel analog is created, it's generally okay for research purposes, but not for other purposes. Yes. Interesting. Um, and you guys are doing. I mean, you have sort of an interesting configuration at your startup. It seems you're very. Um, decentralized or spread out, um, as I've learned uh, chatting with you this morning. Um, and you've got a lot of research collaborations with different mm -hmm. universities. You're doing lots of different stuff. There's lots of different directions we can go. Can you just start talking about what some of the, the most interesting and intriguing collaborations you have are? Uh, you know, it's it, that's like you asking me whether I like my son or my daughter better. Um, you know, <laughs> well, I, I could go kind of chronologically. Well, I would love to. I, I love the. I would love to talk about you know the area of psychedelics as addiction treatment. So I think you guys do mm -hmm. have some collaborations in that area. So what's what's going on there? It's that's our newest one. Um, so uh, and actually, might as well tell the story because it'll give you an idea of Camtech. Um, you know, so. Our first research collaboration was with Professor David Mankey at UMass Dartmouth. Um, we're doing a lot of uh, synthesis and characterization, especially crystallography there, because we ran into a problem in the industry that a lot of these tryptamine molecules are mischaracterized based on what crystalline form they occur, occur in. Um, Dave Mankey and I became friends at Peter Wolzanski's lab, which was my PhD collab, or my, my PhD, where I did my PhD work. Also in that lab um, is Professor Elliot Hulley, who is now at the University of Wyoming, who became another mm. collaborator. Um, he's a brilliant scientist, especially when it comes to kinetics. And so I was telling you about these prodrugs. We were looking at the relative hydrolysis rates of a whole bunch of different kinds of prodrugs um, to sort of get an understanding for how quickly we might expect these molecules to turn into the active. Um, Elliot, um, wonder if he wants me to tell this, but it's probably okay. Uh, Elliot, um, in his lab at the university of Wyoming, um, inherited, um, a, a bunch of cocaine in a safe, um, from a previous professor and needed to get rid of the cocaine cause he didn't want the cocaine in his lab. Um, a new professor at the university of Wyoming, Anna Clara Babadillo, who studies addiction, um, in animal models, um, wanted the cocaine for her research. Um, and so... <laughs> Uh, uh, after a whole bunch of dealing with the DEA who just really was like, why did you tell us about the cocaine? Um, they were able to transfer the cocaine over to the scientist who wanted oh. to use the cocaine for science. Legal um, cocaine trafficking. Right. But <laughs> the, the, the light bulb went on for Elliot and that like, hang on, aren't these molecules that I'm working with supposed to treat addiction? Like, you know, uh, AC, uh, she goes by AC. Um, you know, do you, know, do you want to look into this? And he made the introduction and um, I couldn't be happier. I mean, AC is um, uh, about as top notch a scientist as there is. Um, and so we're working with her now. Um, I think we've already once expanded the collaboration because she's that good um, at uh, looking at whether our drugs can mitigate um, addiction in animals that have become addicted to a drug. How does an animal become addicted to a drug? Um, you get, you know, a mouse or a rat hooked on cocaine or fentanyl. Um, and you can look at this through a variety of different ways. Um, one of them is place preference. You know, you always give the animal fentanyl over here on this side of the cage that it understands is this side of the cage. And then later on, you know, when the animal is hooked on fentanyl, it tends to really like that side of the cage because it expects to get the fentanyl there. Um, so two things we can do there. One, does that happen with our drugs? Because we don't want to create a medicine to cure people that then they get hooked on. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so step one is like, let's, let's only use molecules that we're not going to you know create another problem. Um, step two is like, now that we have these, you know, animals hooked on cocaine from Elliot, um, or, uh, fentanyl, um, 
can we give them our drug and get them to seek out the bad drug? And I think we all agree fentanyl is pretty bad, um, a little bit less. And so that's, that's the work we're doing with addiction right now. Interesting. Um, you know, one of the, not just for addiction treatment, just with psychedelic therapies in general, you know, depending on your perspective, there are different views on, you know, whether or not the actual psychedelic them effects themselves are causally efficacious for the therapy, that they're actually part of the therapeutic process, or they're basically just an inconvenient side effect that makes you have to go through several hours of tripping and being supervised and all of that. So there's a big push right now to try and create non-hallucinogenic psychedelic drug analogs. Are you guys doing any of that? And do you have thoughts on the the plausibility of creating those types of compounds? Yes. Um, I've, uh, all areas of what you said, I'll just ramble. Um, for one, um, yes. Um, I think that there's, um, you know, a, a definite need for that. Um, I don't think it's an either or at all. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's this sort of debate as is the psychedelic experience necessary for the, the, the therapeutic experience or for the therapeutic benefit. Um, and I think that's just way too abstract or general. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the example I like to use there is, um, you know, it might be necessary for you to work with your therapist through your trauma. You know, mm -hmm. and, you know, um, it might be necessary to gain some sort of profound new perspective on, I don't know, a bad habit that you have. It's probably not necessary to treat your migraine, mm -hmm. right? Or, um, you know, some other sort of neuronal disease or something like that. Um, so I think it's going to be one of those sort of context dependent things. And my attitude towards that is like, why choose? Like, why can't we have both? Mm -hmm. um, we really, you know, this is an exciting area. Let's research all of it. So like, I, I, I love both sides of that. Um, argument, if you will, but I don't think it needs to be an argument at all. Right, right. Yeah. So your perspective is basically that there are probably certain things where the subjective effects are really important for the therapeutic effects. And there are probably other things where it's not. And for some people, depending on depending on what the ailment is, yep. you might want one, you might want the other. Yep. And I would ask, you know, and this is another thing I always say, like, I would ask the psychiatrists, like, that's not me. I don't know anything about treating people. Um, I just know that we ought to know what the molecules are before we start testing them or our data is not going to be very good. Mm -hmm. And are, have you guys created any, I mean, I know that other people have um, created analogs of hallucinogenic compounds that do not appear, at least in animals, to be hallucinogenic. Um, do you think we're going to start seeing more of that? Are you guys doing any of that? Um, I hope we're seeing more of that. Um, actually, I know you're going to see more of that. We just haven't published it yet. Um, yeah, we have a whole library of serotonin two-way agonists that do not produce uh, head twitch response. Mm. Whether they're useful or not, you know, I don't know. Don't know yet. Um, I know David Olson is also uh, working on some non-psychedelic psychedelics, which is really cool because I think probably 10 years from now, we'll put all of this research together and we'll have a pretty good idea as to the utility for those molecules, how they differ from the psychedelic ones. And, you know, keep in mind that that's sort of following a, what, 70 year hiatus on any research whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and then this, the ones we're working on are largely based on norcelosin, um, you know, norcelosin, the active of assistant, which was this molecule that no one cared about or loved a few years ago at all. And, you know, uh, to think that that could be sort of the launching point for a whole therapeutic class of drugs is also cool. What, um, can you talk about Camtech a little bit more? So it's, it's a super interesting company. I mean, you're obviously a private company, so you have to have a business model, but you're also doing a lot of this research and you're publishing it, at least some of it that goes out into, you know, public databases. So what's the structure of the company and how, how have you thought about actually creating a sustainable, sustainable business out of this sort of love of this part of the, the research world? Yeah, really good question. I, I guess um, I haven't really overthought it. Um, you know, um, like I said, we we have focused on like the scientific problems, and so you know, I tell my scientists all the time, um, never let me influence the science. Um, you know, the the commercials, I, I will handle the commercial side, um, and um, you know, patents are sort of the answer to that. Um, but uh, let's just do good science, um, and part of good science is seeking the truth and not you know, pursuing some sort of result that we want to have, which is why, mm -hmm. you know, no, 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 don't, this isn't a bad result. Like we may, we might've just learned something and, you know, business development's going to have to take one on the chin, but, you know, do the science. Um, you know, um, like I said earlier, um, my initial career was a patent attorney. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really, really geeked out over patenting, uh, natural products and new combinations and, you know, new versions of, of, of existing things. And so, um, a lot of this fundamental research we're doing um, is, uh, you know, 
supporting um, really great IP. Um, and then with IP, uh, you can go and ask investors for money that you can use to support science. And so that's um, the initial sort of launching point um, of Camtech is that by doing fundamental science, we can create fundamental IP. Um, and then with the fundamental IP, we can, um, you know, uh, get money to do more science. Interesting. So, so in other words, um, as someone who came from academia, where for those of you who have not been in academia, right, the PI, the principal investigator of a lab is effectively the CEO of a small startup. And they're constantly yes. trying to raise money, usually from the government. Um, and right. Cause research is expensive. Uh, it's, it's very technical. It's very labor intensive. Um, and it, it, you know, it takes a lot of time and work. So you're basically saying you're creating an IP portfolio that will generate revenue that will allow you to actually do more research. And so you're sort of creating this loop in the private sector where you can actually facilitate research that's going on, um, in academia in many cases. That's the idea. I would encourage you to contact any, any of our research collaborators and ask you, uh, what the easiest money they ever got was. Um, and you know, the, the universities tell us the same thing. It's like, Hey, we, we really appreciate the work that you're doing. seems like we share an area of interest and, um, you know, we can pay for it. Um, you know, and we can create IP. I mean, that's sort of my, you know, skill is bridging science and IP. And through that bridge, um, we can create, you know, value out of this that we can go into the marketplace and get money to support the science and the world goes around. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like in your role as CEO scientist slash patent law guy, um, it's been really important to create a kind of separation of church and state between the business side of it and the scientists doing the research. I, no, actually, I don't think there's really a separation. Um, I think it's just kind of knowing the priorities, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you gotta, I mean, science, I mean, I, science is sort of holy. Um, and you know, that, that's, that's the, uh, uh, you know, higher authority. Um, but sticking to that rule, there's still plenty of room for commercial interest. Um, mm -hmm. you know, these fundamental scientific discoveries, you know, although maybe not so obvious what the value is going to be, you know, right now, um, you know, they yield, um, results and things that can be applied into new technologies that do have commercial value. And then using the patent system appropriately, you know, you can capture those, um, applications and the technology that comes from the fundamental science later. And so I guess what we do is sort of trust the process and trust that, it's going to work out and we're going to find something and we'll eventually be able to capitalize on it. Whereas I think, you know, um, some scientists or, you know, startup, you know, uh, folks might run into the problem of like, well, I'm the investor. I need to know now where this is going. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas, you know, I think, um, we now have enough of a track record showing that just trusting, um, doing fundamental science and that will get results that are valuable, um, does lead to results that are valuable. Can you give people maybe like a concrete example of something you've done or are in the process of doing in terms of like when you, when you create IP yeah. in Camtech, what exactly is the IP and what are its potential, um, applications? Um, geez. So, I mean, the, the IP would be any advance, um, beyond the state of the art, right? So, I mean, like, you know, go back to 2016, like, there was nothing here. Um, and so, um, you know, really cracking any nut or solving any problem is an advance. Um, then the trick is like, well, okay, how can I use this advance? How can I apply this into some sort of technology? Um, so let's use uh, the magic mushroom example. Um, back, you know, in 2016, 2017, there's no such thing as a standardized magic mushroom formulation. Mm. Um, so figuring out how to make one, um, and then figuring out, you know, what those molecules are um, and putting them together and explaining how to make these standardized formulations to, for example, create an entourage effect or, you know, uh, change the pharmacology at some receptors. Um, that was a big advance. Um, now, it was a gamble, a huge gamble, because think back then, there's no psychedelics industry. There's no no decriminalization, no Kevin Matthews in, in Colorado, no Eckerts in Oregon, like, you know, um, by all... Um, by all estimations, like, you know, this is just an interesting science project that is never going to have an application. But um, now it looks like there might be uh, standardized mushroom formulations out there, in which case, you know, we will probably have, you know, some avenue towards creating a, a product that's supported by IP. And when you say product there, um, so it's very natural on the one hand to think about the, the uh, medical and therapeutic side of this. Obviously, mm -hmm. if you're creating medicines 
prescribed and used by doctors and therapists, you want them to be, you know, standard and re reliable to have, you know, very particular formulations that you actually prove are good for one thing or another. Do you guys think at all about, or do your investors think at all about the commercial side um, in terms of, you know, some of this stuff eventually becoming potentially um, consumer products? Do you, th does, is that a potential future that you see for psychedelics? I think we can contribute significantly to that area. Um, I have no desire ever to make like, um, or manufacture and mass produce products. I like more the R and D side of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and really like, you know, uh, when I started in that area, my only goal ever was, you know, if this ever happens, um, it'd be nice if the ingredients were on the package right, and it would be right. nice if, um, you know, not just psilocybin, but like these other molecules matter. So it's like, if I can affect this area in one way, it's that when this does happen, that on the package, it's just not like magic mushrooms, psilocybin content, 1%. Yep, um, yep. Somebody has paid attention to these other molecules, um, you know, because they, you know, probably matter. Yeah. I mean, that's still to this day, um, a big issue in cannabis where like the majority of packaging, it just sort of says THC, CBD. And you don't get a lot of information about the other stuff. And in many cases, the consumer don't, doesn't even know. There's no awareness that there even is other stuff that might be there. Yes. Um, although, it, you know, uh, I think the positive spin on that is that um, it's changing very fast mm -hmm. in the right direction, I think, in that, um, you know, pre-EBU, um, no one ever even mentioned the name of those molecules. Um, and then, yeah, you're right. Like now you can see THC, THCA, CBD, CBDA on the back of some of the products. Um, I was in a dispensary down by um, Climate Pledge Arena uh, the other day, the, the, the forget the name of it. Um, and I went in there and there was, because um, I always like to see what's going on with the products. Um, there was a, a, a mint that you could buy that was like, CBD, CBC, and CBG. Mm -hmm. No THC. You just take it, I guess, with your cannabis to balance out the THC effects. And I was like, wow, like, you know, there's at least two molecules that nobody knew existed uh, five ago. or six years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, we are seeing more and more of that. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Um, what kind of what kind of investors has Camtech attracted? So you, you have this sort of model where you've basically sold the idea that we're going to create this um, big IP portfolio, and we're basically just doing basic research and R&D stuff to do that. From from what sectors have you gotten interest? Is it mostly people that are that have an eye for developing pharmaceuticals and therapeutics, or or is there more to it than that? Um, it's probably an unsatisfying answer. Uh, our, our initial seed round investors were people who saw opportunities to make you know big returns on investment. You know, oh, wow, you know, that's, I mean, think when we did our seed round, right, there was no indication of any decriminalization or legalization, period, right? So, like, throw all that away. And you had Compass Pathways over there, like, you know, maybe developing uh, psilocybin and MAPS, a nonprofit, um, was developing MDMA, which you could argue is or is not a psychedelic. Um, you know, and I think that the investors saw that we were, you know, you know, really, really early and that we had the skills, um, you know, that were good to have really, really early. Um, and so that's probably how we, you know, you know, we're fortunate enough to get in touch with that group of investors. And then our series A round uh, was led by the Noetic Fund, um, which um, is a fund that is largely focused on psychedelics. So sort of a, a specialty industry um, uh, group. Interesting. So, um, what other kinds of research collaborations do you have? Like areas that we haven't touched on yet. Is there any, are there any major ones that we haven't gotten to? Um, uh, NIH, um, and the national Institute of drug abuse. I think we were the first sort of industry. I mean, cause again, we were the only ones there for a while doing mm -hmm. science. Um, uh, but I think we were the first to collaborate with the government, really. I mean, the, the NIH, NIDA, um, in studying these molecules, um, they're very interested in it, which is sort of how we find our collaborations. It's like, oh, you know, you like studying this? I like studying this. Let's study this together. Um, and then we'll kind of make it work out in the agreement. Um, and so we have a collaboration uh, with NIH, NIDA. Um, that's where we do our uh, telemetry. So, I mean, we can measure uh, temperature depression, head twitch response, uh, locomotor activity um, after giving the animals drugs. Um, we're working with some very talented uh, scientists there on that. 
Um, and then through that collaboration, we um, have uh, access to the PDSP database, and that's uh, Brian Roth's um, mm. project. Um, and that's where we can do some binding affinity assays. Um, and then, you know, you know, you take a step back and look at all of that sort of um, from a 10,000 foot view, you know, we've got Dirk Hoffmeister over here where we're trying to figure out what the mushrooms are making and why. Um, and then take that all the way through to, you know, preclinical models for, you know, addiction and also, um, you know, some other uh, diseases and conditions. Um, and then this year we added a CSO who's a pharma vet, um, and, um, uh, we're doing formal, uh, preclinical testing, um, moving into clinical trials for a bunch of stuff. So it's, uh, it's taken a while to come together. It's come together all very organically. Um, but it's, you know, really sort of a, a mushroom to human clinical trial machine at this point. And are you, are you mainly focused on psychedelics that are related to the contents of magic mushrooms or, or do you work on, you know, other stuff at a significant level? Uh, I would say tryptamines, tryptamines would be my favorite, um, you know, and yeah, that's magic mushroom inspired, right? But yeah, then yeah. like, like I say, pull away the hydroxyl group and it's DMT like, now I'm working and... with DMT analogs and add a 5-methoxy group and now I'm w working with toad uh, uh, compounds. Um, we have a, a couple outliers in there that uh, we're looking at the molecules in Amanita muscaria. Interesting. Is, and those are more like, uh, they're, they're not tryptamines. They're, they're not tryptamines, right? They, can you describe what those are for people? Because that's an interesting difference, I think. Um, you know, er, early in the research, um, it's a, 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 a ibotenic acid, um, um, but totally different um, structures um, and, and a totally different mushroom. Like this is the really cool looking red mushroom with the white spots that's in Super Mario. Uh, brothers. Um, and uh, the effects are, I think, very poorly teased out as well. Um, I've read a bit about it. Um, I actually have never spoken to anyone who's taken Amanita muscaria mushrooms, but like the stories that I've read is like, you know, people will kind of come out of their trip like 10 miles from home, having thought that they were a deer um, <laughs> and then have cuts all over themselves because, geez, how did I get over those barbed wire fences? Hmm. Well, I thought I was a deer, um, you know, so uh, I'm not and, and it works on totally different receptors. Right, uh, right. GABA. And yeah. So like mucimol, which comes from ibotenic acid, I believe these are mm -hmm. basically like sedative hypnotics, almost like a mm -hmm. benzodiazepine, right? Yep. So yeah, it's just very, very different chemistry going on there. Yeah, but when I say early in the process, right, like what else is in that mushroom? Right, right, Does right. it matter? Um, and so uh, the farthest along is probably magic mushrooms and magic mushroom analogs. Um, but I mean, you know, early, you know, in the earlier stage would be, you know, uh, Amanita muscaria, or here's another one for you. Uh, what are all those other molecules in toad secretions? Mm, You've got. Uh, there's got to be a lot. You've got the save the toad people out there who I support, right? Like, please don't kill the Bufo Alvarez toad. It's a nice toad. Um, but then you've got these other people who say that synthetic 5-MeO-DMT is just nothing like the real stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, so, I mean, and that's right up my alley, right? That's right, the, right. Um, oh, well, okay. So there's a difference. What is the difference? I bet it's a chemical. Like, I bet if we look at the chemical composition, we're going to figure out why there's a difference. And then, you know, where I think that work could be important is that if we can closely enough mimic um, the toad secretion, then maybe we don't have to go and mess with the toads. Right. Right. But like right now, it seems like there's at least, you know, uh, a camp out there that says that the 5-MeO-DMT is just you know, uh, not the same as the toad secretion. So there is no substitute. I'm not going to take a caffeine pill in the morning. I need my coffee. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's the basic idea. Um, so you've got, I mean, you, you've sort of found a very interesting niche for yourself and you said a couple things that I want to go back to. Um, I think, you know, there are probably a solid number of PhD students and postdocs that, that listen to this podcast that are thinking about, you know, other things as, as many people do when they get to, to that stage of their career in academia. Um, you said a couple things that were really interesting to me. At one point you said, you know, I've tried not to overthink it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you mentioned that, right, you were a chemist, but then you decided you wanted to go into patent law and you created this kind of superpower by having these two sort of domains of expertise. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the psychology there and the not overthinking it and the sort of how you've created a niche for yourself by sort of uh, by, by creating expertise in two different like separate domains? Sure. Uh, a, I think that that is, that is how you get a superpower. And then the other lesson here is, you know, listen to your wife or partner, um, because it's not easy at the time. I mean, I was a struggling, 
chemistry graduate student and uh, my my phd advisor described me as a typical b minus student <laughs> uh, that's that's andy he's your typical b minus student uh that's a quote that everyone in the group likes to remind him of these days um you know but uh you know being a well, first of all, being a typical B minus student in Pete Wolzanski's group is an achievement, I think. Um, but then second of all, like as soon as you take your typical B minus student out of this very, very um, high level program and put that person anywhere where that skill can be applied, there's the superpower, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, uh, I could have gone into actually did dabble in brewing, um, right? There's a nice chemical application. Um, natural products and drugs would be another one. Like I bet I had, you know, have a whole career ahead of me in the coffee industry or, you know, something else like some, something where you have a, a natural, um, passion or interest in it and some way to, uh, apply, you know, the earlier skill. And that was patent law for me initially. It's like, oh, well, um, um, I guess I'll never make it as a chemist. Um, but over here in this law firm, like, oh, you know, people appreciate me for my, for my chemistry. Um, and now it's actually probably three things, you know, the, uh, you know, sort of, uh, earliest interest, which was like drugs and pharmacology, then learning chemistry. And then, um, you know, sort of outside this podcast, but, um, developing expertise in chemical patent law has also been very helpful. And then sort of, sort of combining those three things together. Um, you know, it, uh, I mean, anyway, to support your hypothesis, like having those two skills, the combination, I think you can do something way cooler than just having one skill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the part about not overthinking it, that's, that's something I've, I've learned over the years as well. What, why do you think that's important? Um, you know, maybe that wasn't even the best way to say it. Um, like really, and this, this gets back to, you know, um, you know, listen to your, your, your partner. Um, my wife has always been very supportive in me of, you know, um, don't worry about the money. Don't worry about, you know, you know, the, uh, reputation or the career success or whatever, like, you know, focus a little bit more on, uh, you know, what you like doing. Um, I've also in the past worked with, um, a really good friend and executive coach, um, Miranda Holder. Uh, she runs an executive coaching firm. Um, and you know, she would always encourage me to follow my gut. You know, what's your gut telling you? Well, you know, not, not what you have to do or what you should do, but what do you want to do today? Um, and I think that that's, very hard to do, um, especially as you get more and more responsibility and more investors to answer to, um, to, you know, not do what everybody thinks you should do, but to go and, you know, uh, we used to use the term follow your nose um, and do something you think is interesting. Um, but I swear that nine times out of 10, it is that sort of freedom to go and follow my nose or go and do give myself permission to do the thing that's interesting that causes me to bump into something that has a relationship to the thing that I should be doing. And then all of a sudden, like genius, like, oh, how did you ever make that connection? It's like, I don't know. I was, you know, walking around in the yard. You know, uh. <laughs> how do you approach managing this company? Because you've got all these academic research collaborations, you've got the legal side of it, you've got investors to answer to, you know, I imagine you probably don't have a typical day, but how do you how do you balance and juggle all of these different complexities that that are involved here? I mean, hopefully not poorly. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, Is this another case where it's important not to overthink it? No, here, I think the, the really important thing is um, have great people around you. Um, I'm probably a terrible manager, um, you know, probably terrible at ops or finance, um, but I have um, excellent people um, that are working with me at Camtech. Um, you know, one of the compliments that I've gotten in the past, you know, several times is that I'm good at sort of staying in my lane. Um, you know, um, as CEO, that's very hard because the whole darn thing is my lane. Right. Um, but at the same time, like I try to make sure that I'm working with people that, um, you know, have a given expertise and that they are confident in their expertise. And then I try to defer to them and empower them in their area to really own that area. Um, you know, I don't question my finance guy about finance. I mean, I might ask for something to be explained, but, um, you know, I, I think that's how I've, I've gotten through. It's, um, it's not me. Um, it's just that I have a lot of, uh, you know, really talented and good friends and colleagues I've developed 
you know, uh, over the years. Mm -hmm. How do you actually find good people like that? And, and I mean that in the sense of like, I'm guessing, and maybe I'm wrong. I'm guessing that not everyone in your company that reports to you is as deeply passionate about chemistry and psychedelics as you were. And so what attracts the good people or am I, am I wrong about that? Um, I don't think it's a right or wrong thing. I think it's, um, you know, a, a line drawing problem. Um, and that's one thing that I try to do in every relationship. Um, every new relationship at Camp Tech is, um, you know, what are you interested in and what do you want to do? And, you know, what, what would you enjoy working on? And also what don't you want to do? Um, cause if we can make, if we can find or, or create a role for you doing what you want to do, um, you're probably going to like that. And, you know, I think the only way to do great work is to, you know, love what you're doing. Um, and so, uh, you know, take every one of the scientific collaborations, right? Like I didn't go in there and say, okay, I'm going to give you money and I expect you to give me these deliverables and you can do your own science on your own time. And I don't want to hear about it. It's more of a, wow, I really love the science that you're doing. And, you know, do you think that, you know, you might want to you know, do some of that with my molecules. And, and then oftentimes the answer is like, wow, I'd love to have access to your molecules. Like, great, let's do it. And now I, mean, I don't need to manage you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so a question that, that I often ask people is, and you know, you, you've probably partially answered this already, but it's okay to reiterate if, if we need to, um, what are some exciting, outstanding questions in psychedelic science? that we don't know the answer to today, but that you think we'll know the answers to relatively soon, two, three, four years from now. That's tough because some of them are like, you know, things that I want to know the answers to two, three, four years from now. Um, I think the entourage effect is one. And I think that's well within our grasp, at least in the two, three molecule pairings. Um, uh, that'll be interesting to kind of at least have, um, you know, a, a good, working understanding and some predictability about the different effects of different magic mushrooms based on their chemical composition. Um, another one that, uh, fascinates me, and I know this fascinates Paul Stamets and some others now too, it's gaining uh, additional attention is wood lover paralysis. There is a phenomenon out there, um, where certain magic mushrooms, um, uh, highly, highly correlated with magic mushrooms that grow on hardwood substrates. So like your, uh, psilocybe cyanescens, your psilocybe azarescens and related species in other parts of the world. Um, people will eat these mushrooms and they will, um, have your typical magic mushroom trip. Like, I can't believe I just said typical ma magic mushroom <laughs> trip. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but then, you know, later on, you know, hours after the trip or even into the next day throughout the next day, uh, these people will have, uh, muscle paralysis. Uh, uh, we've done a lot of survey work on this and, you know, talk to a lot of folks. Um, but, um, it's sort of like your muscles get fatigued, um, really, really easily and really powerfully. So it's like, um, you know, one of the best examples would be like, you know, you, you get up in the morning and you start buttoning your shirt and by sort of the third button, you can't button the fourth button. <laughs> um, what is going on? Scary stuff. Um, so we're, we're collaborating with, she's like 20 people on this now, everything from Dirk Hoffmeister and like, Hey, and what's the difference in these mushrooms? Because again, it must be a chemical difference. Um, you know, different effect. There's gotta be a different, it's a different drug. It's not psilocybin. It's something else is going on. Um, so what's in these different mushrooms and can we correlate some sort of chemical difference with a higher incidence of the wood lover paralysis? Um, you know, and is that a species or genetic thing, or is this like a patch by patch sort of thing that like, uh, and, and we don't know yet. I mean, for, for all I know, it's like, uh, you know, mushrooms that grow on alder that were next to a rhododendron plant. I mean, that's possible. Um, uh, but figuring that one out, I think is going to be really important. And it's also been one of our really fun projects because it's purely a puzzle. Um, and it's a puzzle that fascinates the pharmacologists and the biologists alike. Um, but I say that that's going to be of increasing importance because everybody is running around right now to decriminalize or call off the dogs on, um, uh, uh, on magic mushrooms, uh, which I think is going to give rise to a kind of craft magic mushroom industry mm. because boy, don't I want the most potent one. I heard right, that right. one's so cool. Um, and then what's going to happen? People are going to show up, um, you know, at my wife's work, she's an ER doc, uh, with late onset paralysis that sort of looks like a disease called myasthenia gravis. Um, it also looks like, um, you know, something that might shut down like airways and stuff like that. Mm. So 
people could wind up in the hospital getting intubated, um, I see. which could dramatically frustrate some of these, hey, call off the war on uh, magic mushrooms movements. So I see. Interesting. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, interesting to think about. What, um, what, I mean, what are some of your favorite ongoing projects at Camtech that we haven't touched on? Is there anything in particular? Oh, man. Uh, I mean, it sounds like you're doing an incredible diversity of things. Oh, we're all over the place. Yeah. Um, well, because, and, and one of my uh, co-founders, um, Davis Woolley, uses, you know, taught me this analogy. And I, I think to a large extent, um, it was true, at least early on. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to like a 4th of July pool party where they throw a lot of coins and stuff down at the bottom and then say go. And, you know, you go down there and try to pick up as many coins as you can. Like, I feel like that was the early days at Camtech. It's like, wow, like, you know, nobody knows anything around here. Like there's all these cool things to go and do and we could be first, we could be first over here and here. Um, and so that's where a lot of the diversity came from. Um, you know, there were just so many places to move into, um, to your question about, you know, other stuff that like, I think is really cool right now. Um, we've been, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, some of these molecules have been, you know, mischaracterized uh mm -hmm. for, forever in the literature and then you know when i say mischaracterized you know you might call uh, uh well i mean this actually just happened to compass pathways right they were referring to psilocybin as you know their psilocybin form a or whatever they were calling it but it was really a hydrate right um oh big deal right there's just some water in there um well you know that's uh 18 grams per mole of a difference um and that seems to be an issue that is just ubiquitous throughout this class of molecules in that you can have uh different salt forms you can have you know uh you know two tryptamines per you know anion you know so a dianionic uh two tryptamine thing um you know there's the free base molecules you can have one two three four plus molecules of solvent included and in all of these instances um you know the the molecular weight of the molecule is wrong um, which means that, you know, when our biological collaborators go to very carefully weigh out milligram quantities of this molecule, uh, that everything looks great, um, they're, um, they're weighing out a molecule that they have the wrong identity of. And so when they go to use the molecular weight to calculate how many moles they used or what the potency is, um, all the way down the line, um, you know, all the numbers are wrong. And so that was something that frustrated me a lot early on and that you look at the literature and you look at the data there and you're, ah, I don't understand why our numbers are a little bit off. And it's like, aha, it's because all of these numbers are wrong because all these molecules are mischaracterized. And so, um, we're trying to come up with some, I mean, first of all, characterize all the molecules and then also come up with some ways to quickly measure the differences and avoid mistakes. Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, figure out ways to guarantee one form over another form, uh, basically so that, you know, all of the scientific data can build upon a good foundation instead of a shaky foundation. And if people want to, um, keep abreast of the research that you're doing or that's adjacent to what you're doing, is there a place like your, like a website or social media that you have that you can point people to? And also, can you maybe just sort of give a list of some of your collaborators again that people might look up and, and follow on, you know, Google Scholar or something like that? Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, for one, we, we do like to your earlier point, um, we do try to publish, you know, I think it's our responsibility of scientists to, you know, publish our, our results. Um, and that's something that we honor with all of our collaborators because they're scientists. Um, and so the academic literature is probably the best place to learn what we're doing. And we try to get it out there. Um, you know, as soon as we, you know, dot our I's and cross our T's with IP, try to get the information out there so others can use it. Um, then we often post updates on our webpage, which is cam.tech, C-A-A-M dot T-E-C-H. Um, social media. Um, I think we have a Twitter. Um, I sometimes post on LinkedIn, but we are not very, uh, loud on the sort of self promotion side. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we do try to be good and do our job on, in the scientific literature, but I'm not sure if we actually, I don't think we've ever paid for a promotion, um, or, or, but you, or, you post anything that you publish on your website. Um, no, not, not everything, but, um, Some stuff select things. Yeah. Um, but everything that, yeah, well, scientific literature is probably the most comprehensive place that we, we publish this stuff. And just in terms of like, just the general area of magic mushroom chemistry, let's mm -hmm. say, um, can you say again, some of the, the top names there, if people want to go dig into that literature? 
I mean, I think Dirk Hoffmeister um, is the number one guy in uh, magic mushroom biochemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm biased, right? I mean, he's my collaborator and I'd call him a friend now um, and his group. But I mean, he seems to be uh, pushing the envelope forward um, at all of these sort of fundamental questions that we're talking about, um, you know, finding new molecules in mushrooms, um, understanding the um, you know, uh, underlying biochemical processes for how they get made, um, so on and so forth. So that would be, um, you know, on the, uh, on the biochemistry side, you know, my first stop on the sort of magic mushroom side, um, uh, it's hard to tell, uh, cause you know, it, a lot less in the scientific literature there and a lot more kind of press releasey, um, yeah, yeah. don't know if this is peer reviewed, uh, sort of data. Um, I tend to think, um, the stuff I see from Alan Rockefeller is really good. He seems to be, um, a really good mycologist. Um, uh, Paul Stamets is, you know, I think the, you know, godfather of the whole magic mushroom area. Um, and then, you know, I, I think it's also important to look at, sort of different sources. I mean, uh, Paul Stamets is a mycologist. Um, Mm -hmm. and so that's sort of that group that, you know, you know, since, and geez, he's been in it forever. Um, but focusing on the mushroom, right. Um, not the molecules, right. And that's where, you know, looking at Paul Stamets uh, understanding of certain magic mushrooms and, you know, how they might affect people. Um, and then also looking at what Dirk Hoffmeister is doing to try to get clues as to what's going on over there. Um, those two things are important. Um, and then, um, the folks that use Sona, um, on the synthetic side have, have done a lot of really nice work. Um, I really like, uh, you know, uh, the work from, uh, Alexander Sherwood, um, and his group, they've, they synthesized bayasistin and erugosin and norsilosin, um, and had a nice paper on that a few years ago. Um, you know, so that's coming at the magic mushrooms from the, uh, you know, more synthetic side. And they also, uh, along with Adam Halberstadt, uh, did some good, um, animal behavioral, uh, assays with those molecules. Well, Andrew, this has been, uh, this has been fascinating. I, I definitely learned uh, quite a bit that I didn't know before. Is there anything, any final thoughts you have that you want to leave people with, you know, just in terms of what we talked about or anyone who's just generally interested in this area of the scientific, the scientific universe? Um, I wouldn't know where to begin with a final thought. I mean, we could go on for hours, um, but uh, no, not really. I think we, we've hit you know some some really exciting areas, and I thank you for having me on the podcast. Mm-hmm.